Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and in each episode, we dive deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your healing journey. Hey guys, it is out. If you haven't seen it yet, our documentary, Dr. Patient, after years of work, is out and available to watch, to rent, to own, to share at drpatientmovie.com. And today, as you've probably noticed, we've been doing some special episodes about the making of the documentary. Um, Today is one of those episodes, and I am so delighted and honored to be here with Jamie Lynn Bailey, who is a patient, a friend uh, in the movie. She tells her story and she's been so generous to once again, come on live on a podcast and really share some of the heart of the journey. Welcome, Jamie. It's so exciting to have you here. Thank you so much, Dr. Jill. I am so excited to be here and talk about this super fun and experience that we got to experience together. Yeah, so I'm going to go back and just share my perspective because we, um, you know, the producer director came to us and they were going to follow a little bit of my own journey through breast cancer and Crohn's disease. But a big part of this documentary was going to be following some patients. And of course, like choosing the patients, we were literally in our office. I was talking to my office manager and the director and producer said, you know, find some people who might be interested or willing Um, And I don't remember exactly, I'd love to hear your perspective of how you got the call or how we came across your name, but there is no doubt that it was kind of a divine, um, like picking you out because your story was so close to mine as far as us both dealing with breast cancer. And then I'll never forget when I walked, I had seen the chart, I hadn't really known much about you before. And I walked up to the lobby and I looked at your name and it was Jamie Lynn. And it was not only Jamie Lynn, but it was the exact spelling of my sister. And I I told you that. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. What was, do you remember like when we first reached out to you to see if you wanted to not only be a patient, but also be part of a film? And and do you remember anything about that? I do actually. I remember exactly where I was. I was working at the time. I was I was actually working at a winery, but I had gotten a phone call from your office and I had been on the wait list for a little while to see you. And I it was really crazy how I found you. I, one of my daughter's friends that she swam with, her mom and I just got talking one day about breast cancer. She's like, I have this amazing woman that I work with that does functional medicine. And, I, and I'm really certain she went through breast cancer too. You should reach out to her. And I think she's on a wait list. So I said, okay. So right immediately I called and, and got on the wait list. And I had been on the wait list for a little bit, maybe a few months. And um, and I got the phone call and I was like, oh, I was really excited and nervous at the same time. And, um, and I, you were saying, hey, uh, Dr. Jill is starting to increase her online presence. And she really, you were one of four people selected to join in this movie that we're trying to produce. And I, and, you know, and we could see you on Monday and it was like Thursday and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I was like, yes. And, you know, my husband's a videographer. So I was like, okay, he's got to give me all the keep the clues and tips and everything to to do it. But I was super honored to get that phone call. It was so fun. Oh, Jamie, and the honor was ours too, because obviously like first time a doctor, we talked about this multiple times. Like to me, I was so nervous about bringing a film crew into this sacred space between a doctor and patient, because this is like you sharing your life, sharing your journey, asking for medical advice. And to me, that, that relationship is so sacred that I was a little terrified, like, okay, how does this work with the cameras? And I just, like I said, I want to honor you because you were insightful enough and maybe partially because of your husband being in that world. And that was a gift because some of the, one of the things we're going to watch in just a moment was actually because of your husband being able to video it, we got both sides of it, but it it couldn't have been a better fit. And like I said, I think it was divine. You were chosen <laughs> because your story so resonates with people watching Maybe we'll just jump in real quick and watch the clip and then we can dive into talking more about it. So here we are. We're going to share with you all listening a little clip from the movie and then we'll um, come back. Hello. Gosh, look at her hair. You look so gorgeous. You Thank look you. so beautiful. Oh my goodness, I love it. That's oh, amazing. Thanks. Oh my gosh. You look like a new woman. <laughs> oh, thanks. I feel I feel like it too. Yeah. I, I do. 
And oh, then, great. Yeah, and then let's look at your immune and anti-cancer support. With your oncologist, did you get a recent blood count at all in the last six months? I did, yes. Um, How was I think it? we sent them. I sent them over oh, to Oh, cute. Got it. I got it right in front here. <laughs> so let me take a peek. Well, they just took screenshots, so sorry, it's kind of all. No, it totally <laughs> works, yeah. Uh, your D is low. We want to for sure address that. That's so critical for cancer and prevention and everything, and that's mm -hmm. easy to fix. Your cancer and androgens look great. CEA is great. Uh, white blood count, so it's close to normal. Um, yeah. I was wondering yeah. about that stragglers, so I was going to try to get rid of that, but because you're still a little bit under normal, it's probably going to be helpful. So what we'll, what we'll do over time is you don't have to take all of these things forever, but I'll just kind of okay. slowly, as you get, you know, get further and further out, we can decide what's less important because um, you are doing so well. I'm so proud of you. I really, really, I feel honored and privileged to be part of your journey because it's um, to see the transformation. And you're going to do amazing. I already know yeah. it. Like, oh, <laughs> I know there's kind of those little fear seeds that come because they do for all of us. But they do. But I have do. no doubt you have a long, amazing life ahead of you. Oh, um, thank you so much. I just, I, you're welcome, I, just, I just love you so much. <laughs> Love right back at you, and you're doing a great job. So you take care of her, okay? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Will do. All right. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye. Mm. <sighs> I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, she's always awesome. <sighs> she's glowing. <laughs> She really is. She looks like a different person. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> and that is why I do what I do every day. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. We knew this would be poignant, but like, oh my gosh, that Jamie, that is so precious for you to share your heart like that and, and give people a glimpse. And, and mm -hmm. I remember like that last little bit there, I was holding back tears so hard because I just, <laughs> I saw you and I saw already and even now more so because it's been a year or so since that scene was filmed and the way you've transformed and overcome, it's just amazing. And it's funny because I get to witness as a doctor, but it's not me at all. It's you <laughs> doing the work. <laughs> what are, what's your thoughts as you see that scene <laughs> that we filmed? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so much emotion, just so much emotion. You know, I, when I, when I first started seeing you, like, I just, I felt so rotten, you know, I just, I was feeling just icky, everything my, from being able to get on and off the floor to depression that was so, so serious. And, you know, I have two young daughters and when I was going through it, I, they were really young and getting on and off the floor with them was a struggle and getting out of bed some days was a struggle. And when I see that scene, it like, it brings all of that happiness back of like, oh my gosh, like we went through this journey together and you've made me healthy again. Like, um, you know, so often I, you know, you go through a journey and there are not maybe doctors aware of some of the medicine of some of the functional stuff we could be doing to make ourselves healthier. And it's just profound. Like um, when you get, when you get on the other side of cancer, you kind of really look at your life, you know, what is, what is important, what's not important, you know? Um, and I feel like in that moment, it was just like, I, I couldn't have been more thankful and just honored to have been able to work with you and for you to, I felt seen, you know, I felt really seen. Um, there's not a lot of doctors or physicians out there that see you for who you are and um what you're going through and can relate and connect on that level and i think that's where all those tears came from was just she sees me she knows she understands i like have this really big connection with her so um i just i i think all that just floods back all that emotion and uh, it's good it's happiness you know it mm -hmm. is me too like really <laughs> And I mean that with every word. It is such an honor 
to be able to be part of your journey or anyone else who's in that healing, like to, for, to, cause like we said in the beginning, this is a sacred space that you allow me into your life and this realm and your healing and like to help you and to kind of, and, and as you know, I've been there too. And so I think that actually adds, I remember the scene that you haven't seen here if you're listening, but if you watch the movie, you'll see the whole thing when we first met in the clinic and I hug you and it was like this, we both, we had just met and I said, I love you. And you said, I love you right back. And it was so natural. Like there was no, like, it, it didn't even feel weird. It was like, I yeah. I really love you. Cause I know what you're going through. And that was in the beginning. Like you had just found out your cancer. You're just starting treatment. And I, I'll never forget. This must've been divine, but I looked at you and I said, this is just the beginning. He's going to do great things. <laughs> I remember and, that. Yeah, me too. And I look back, I still <laughs> cry with that scene too, because I, I remember just seeing, because what happens happened in my life was like, as I saw suffering as a transformation and a teacher, and I saw that sometimes God allows these really difficult things in our lives and they suck and they're not fun. And we wish so bad we wouldn't have to experience it. But if we're open in that journey, in that suffering, all of a sudden we find a part of ourselves we've never found. We, like you were saying in the beginning, we look at life a little differently. We, um, we, we maybe take more risk than we would have before. And in the end, I want to talk about where you are now and what you're doing to share this message with the world. Cause you're doing that, you're giving it back mm -hmm. and you're doing that in real time. But, um, what would you say if you look back at the girl who came to my office the first time and then now today where you're at now, how has that changed or transformed and what differences do you see now that you're on this side of that journey? I definitely, I, I definitely feel like a, com a completely different person. I mean, I, you know, I feel like on the, on the before side of cancer, maybe, um, I thought that I, this is the way I wanted to go with my life, my career. Um, and then post-cancer, it was like, no, it, it was kind of like a, oh, a wake up call, an awakening, a new awakening of this is not where you're meant to go. This is where you're meant to go. And I feel like, you know, um, that God always puts things in your path and you Always, I think when something like this happens, you know, if, if you get disease or you, an accident or, you know, something profound happens in your life and you question, like, why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? Why am I, you know, and you can get really stuck in that or you can start looking at, okay, maybe it's because I'm meant to do something more. Or maybe it, and I'm meant to give people hope. And I think that I've connected with so many other people now um, who have had cancer in their life or going through cancer treatment and have asked like, what would you do here? How would you do this? Or um, could you give me any tips and tricks for this? You know, and I just feel like on a different level now that I can help people in that way. And so I feel like there was a substantial reason why I went through what I went through and it's to get me here now in this moment and to maybe bring hope and healing to other people too. I just, it was just a huge shift from what I had originally thought my life was going to be to now. And I'm so much happier. It's, it's my happy place now. It's my happy place. I love that you can say that because those who are maybe listening and they're in the midst of something, sometimes it's hard in the very midst of it. Um, to see, I remember uh, like curled up in a ball, nausea, no hair because of chemo. I mean, we've both been through that and like, oh, this really is not fun. <laughs> and it didn't yes. seem like there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Now I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness, I would never have the platform as a physician, as a teacher, as a healer that I have now without having experienced suffering and experienced and overcome cancer. And it's almost like God gave me a story so that I could actually reach out and inspire and help others. And you're doing the same thing, but in the midst of it, it can be so hard and, um, yes. and so difficult, but I think you're right. You dig down and you say, is that meaning and purpose? I heard someone recently talk about in a, in the situation of like armed forces or training or Navy SEALs with a commanding officer that says, here's where I want you to go and what you, what I want you to do. You never ask why you say, how can I do that? Right. And mm -hmm. I like, I think that's almost an equivalent of like, it's so easy to ask, well, why is this happening and get all uh, full of that attitude. But instead of we're like, well, how can we use this for transformation? The, mm -hmm. the kinds of questions we answer or ask in the midst of suffering can make all the difference, right? Absolutely. 
And it's crazy, you know, when I was very first diagnosed and I remember just being in curling up, like you said, curling up in a ball and I was in my bedroom laying on my bed and just crying and crying. And I'd been doing it for probably two days. And my husband, um, he comes in there and he's like, listen, you're going to get up out of this bed and you're going to come downstairs and it's cold outside, but you're going to wrap a blanket. I'm pulling this rocking chair out. You're going to sit in this rocking chair and we're going to watch our daughters ride bikes. And I was like, okay. And so I got up and I did that. And that was like, I think the strength, the swift kick, I guess that I needed to really say, okay, I'm just going to take one day at a time. I'm going to do what I need to do and we're going to get through it. And then at then when it's all over, you'll look back and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe what I just did. And, and I, you know, and you did, and I did that. And I feel like, you know, you get to that point even afterwards, because you're healing. It's not just like, chemo, radiation, you know, there's an after part of emotion that you really have to live through and just live it, cry and sob and pray. And I remember being on the bathroom floor in a heap and just saying, God, you know, I know, you know, and that's all I could say because I just didn't have the words. And, um, I just feel like, you know, there's even that part at the end, you know, where you kind of go through that, emotional part where you're, you know, oh my gosh, what the heck did I just do? What, what the heck? I just did all this stuff. And you look back and you're like, that, that's crazy. What just happened. And I just did it all. And now it's kind of the reflection and you still have that emotional trauma there, you know, but just one day at a time, right. You put one day at a time behind you and, and talk to people and, you know, share stories. And I think that's what life is all about, right? Connection and meaning and love and connection and with others. So true. And I love the story about your husband saying, come on, get out. So how in that vein, how did your daughters, I mean, you have these beautiful young girls who at the time of your diagnosis were how old and how old, tell us a little bit about their, they were like, they were pretty young when you were first diagnosed, right? Yes. I think they were four and two or five and two. Yeah. I, Emma might've just been five. Um, and yeah, she was because she was in kindergarten. What when you were diagnosed? The I was 36 when yeah. I was diagnosed. Young, young. young. <laughs> yes. yes. And I found the lump in my armpit. Yeah. So I just I think shaving one day and I was like, oh, this is weird. Um, and you know, once they did the mammogram, the ultrasound, they found that there was two. So it ended up being stage two. And they I had a double mastectomy um because it had gone outside of the tumor and into the breast tissue. So the margins were close, and that's what made them want to do radiation and chemo. Um, and yeah, my daughters are really young. And I remember my cousin once saying, uh, she was, a, she's a baby nurse for a long time. And she said, you know what, tell your girls that you're going to, the doctors need to take your boobs and that they're going to give you new ones and you're going to look like Barbie because they are, they took my nipples and everything. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am going to tell them that. So, so I did, I just told, I, and you know, and they thought nothing about, okay, all right, Barbie. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is actually great. I love that story so much. Oh my goodness. That's great. Um, and yeah, how did uh, like having daughters and having a husband who was obviously supportive, how did that help? What was difficult about it? Cause I think this is a different, um, breast cancer. You and I have this unique experience as very young women of uh, facing this, mm -hmm. which is again, no different. I mean, people who are in their fifties, sixties, any age it's difficult, but mm -hmm. in someone who's under the age of 40, it's much more aggressive and a lot more people don't make it. Mm -hmm. How was that with your, did your children inspire you? How did your husband help or tell us a little bit about just relationships during that process? Absolutely. So, um, one of the craziest things was I was, when I was diagnosed, it was January of, um, 2020. So the world was shutting down. Mm -hmm. And when I had to go through my double mastectomy, it was March of 2020. And so they literally were shutting down the hospitals. They said, you're going to go in for this eight hour double mastectomy surgery. And then we're going to outpatient you. And I was like, no. Wow. Um, so thankfully I didn't have to do that, but, um, I remember coming out of surgery and just crying for my husband, like, where's my husband? I need my husband. I need him here. Um, they were so amazing. My family, you know, my daughters were very interested, you know, when I come home with the, um, the in-body injector on my arm and, uh, you know, my husband would make, they would get me the, um, flavored soda waters, you know, that I needed because of course, 
that first week of chemo, I was drinking all that pH water, pH water, pH water. And then after that, it was like, I did not need still water. I did not want <laughs> still water in my mouth. So it was like sparkling water, please. Yeah. So they would, you know, have fun picking out different flavors and things. Um, we had a garden that year because, you know, everybody was home and working on their house or their garden that year. And we were out working on our garden. And I remember feeling like um, we were together building this garden that in the spring, I felt you know, almost not like you're dying, but you're so sick, you know, you're so sick and you've got no hair and the chemo. And, and so I just felt like I was very weak, but this garden was blooming and blossoming and it was so full of life. And we were able to met, you know, do this together as a family. And then as the fall came, my chemo and radiation were, were over by the end of August. And I started, um, I started coming alive again and starting to feel more like myself a little, a little, little at a time, but then the garden started to, to, die, you know, because it was fall now. And so it was like this really cool um, circle of life. I think I felt um, during that time is like the, those, that garden gave me life and gave me that um, vibrance. And then when it was done, it was, you know, ready to harvest. And then I was um, alive, you know, so it was, yeah, blooming. Yes. And so I thought that was, um, that was pretty profound feeling, I think. And the, you know, the girls and Ray, we all really worked on that together and it was, you know, super great. I do say there was a couple of times, you know, when, when you're going through chemo and I, when I had that in-body injector on and it would give me that dose, you know, that yes. went into your bones and tried to make your, you know, white blood cells multiply, um, when that thing would go off and it was like about, you know, 12, I think to 24 hours after the, so it would go off once when I was there at chemo and then again later. And that second time I got, you know, I would get so sore behind my, it would start at the base of my neck and it would just go down on the back of my body. And it was so, so painful. And I remember just laying on the couch and I couldn't lay on certain pillows. I couldn't lay on certain things. And I felt so bad because, you know, the girls would want to come over and like, give me a hug. Or, and I'm like, I can't, I couldn't even just, I couldn't even be touched. Oh. And so, um, on those, on those moments where, you know, I didn't feel like that and we were laying on the tramp or on the, um, hammock out back, it was like, just cuddle. This is snuggle because this is the time we can do it because I know that that those two to three days I feel so rotten. So that was hard. Um, you know, as a parent doing that. But um, I think the girls really, they had a lot of fun with wigs, you know, but that, that was a really fun thing we got to do. My husband shaved my head and um, that was, you know, emotional because I think so much of us have this, especially women, our hair is like such a big defining feature. And, and as a woman with breast cancer, it's like, okay, now I've lost my boobs. Yes. Now I've lost my hair, you know, and Am I now I've lost a woman, my right? I mean, yes. I could not agree more with that. It was so funny because the surgery and the dysfunction of my breast and my scars was way, of course it's covered too. Right. But still like, yes. I think the lack of hair and I had the same thing, chemo as at the time husband shaved off all my hair and I was bald for yes. many months. That was way more traumatic than almost so. anything else, wasn't it? Because it's almost like yes. a walk. I remember like walking by a mirror and almost like double taking, who is that? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's me. I have no hair. Like I forget because when you're in your body, you don't see yourself, right? And then you yes. get a glimpse of this bald, emaciated woman. You're like, oh my goodness. That's, it's almost shocking, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. And going back and seeing pictures of that time. And I was like, oh my goodness, this just... You, you know, you look at yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, it looks so sick. And then, you know, by the time and I kept my eyebrows for a little while, which that was like, okay, I've got my eye eyebrows. That's okay. Uh -huh. um, but then when you lose your eyebrows and your eyelashes, and then you're like, oh my goodness, who is this person? Right. And, you know, I remember I, I uh, written a little excerpt on this, but it is so funny when you start losing your eyelashes and they're falling out and then they get in your eye and you get one in your eye and then you can't lift your eyelid open to get the eyelash out because you have no eyelashes exactly. to grab a hold of. <laughs> These things no one knows, right? About I, know. <laughs> I, I was like, oh no, how am I going to get this thing out? You know? So, I mean, it's fun that we can make fun, you know, like laughter and lightheartedness of this, but it's like a real thing, you know, it's things people don't talk about. Um, 
but yeah, it is, it is quite profound when you lose your hair for sure. I think that was the hardest thing. And you know, the first thing I did was cut it all off real yeah. short. And then it was like, okay, we're just going to buzz it. And then, um, I buzzed it. And then, you know, I was like, I don't know. And Ray goes, let's just, let's just pick it. We're going to shave it all off. And I said, okay, all right, let's do it. Let's just do it all. And you know, that same year I had basal cell carcinoma on my head. So they had done a, um, uh, -huh. uh yes, thank you. Um, treatment and they had scraped, you know, three or four layers down. And so I had this big old indention on the top of my head and then I'm bald and I'm like, oh my goodness, where are the wigs? <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I so get you. And I remember my husband at the time was like, whatever you want to spend on wigs. And so I had the blonde and the redhead and I had <laughs> the same thing and he would try them on with this. I mean, we just had a lot of fun and laughter. Um, yeah. But the, at the core, it, it is really, really hard. You and I, right before we came on, you were talking about an excerpt from my book. And I thought it was so poignant because I remember this so well, where I was just like looking in the mirror, at my scarred body, my bald head, and, and I still had skin lesions. I mean, it was just, I was a mess and like crying and then, okay, wipe my face off, clean it up, put on a little mascara and go out and say, sweetheart, what would you like for dinner? Right. And mm -hmm. let's talk just a little bit about that. Cause I think that's, especially as women, um, caretakers of your children and your husband, how did you balance that? Like receiving the care and saying, I need help or I don't feel well today, which we both did. But then sometimes we just had to put on a face and not pretend, but kind of pretend and say, how did you balance that? Have you learned anything in that process? Because I think that's so powerful for other women too, just feeling like they have to show up and maybe they don't feel like it or they're hurting or they're suffering. It's so true. It's, it's so true. And I was, you know, I, again, it's another blessing in disguise for me, but um, I actually feel kind of blessed that when I went through it, it was during COVID because my kids were able to be home, even though, I mean, they got to see a lot of everything going on, um, but they were also there. My husband was there. And so it wasn't too crazy. Um, but, you know, even before cancer, you know, as women, like you said, I'm, you know, and moms and parents and wives and, you know, working, you're running and doing so many things all the time. There's always so many things in your brain all the time. And it was, I had a lot of guilt laying in bed some days, yeah. you know, knowing I have to, I have to mend. I can't use my arms. I remember my doctor saying, um, your spirit animal is a T-Rex, you know, so I couldn't, my arms couldn't go past a certain point. And so, um, being, a, having somebody, you know, bringing you things and it, it's not what, us, most of us women are used to. And so it was very humbling to have to not, um, get up and do everything all the time, but there was a good balance, um, at least for me during COVID because, you know, I could get up, I could do a few things here and there around the house and I could, you know, play or the kids could come in and they could sit on the bed with me and we could do a board game or read a book. And so, um, but it is, it's, it is really hard, especially you and you fight internally with feelings of guilt, feelings of shame. Um, I'm not doing what I need to do. I'm not pulling my share that what, am I always going to be in this state? You know, um, I should be, I should be, I should be, I you know, there's so many shoulds. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and I think really it's just trying to allow yourself grace, you know, um, and communicating too with your partner. Cause I had to, I had to tell Ray, there was times where I would just say, I can't, I just can't do this today. I just can't. And I remember, um, there was, there's a picture going, uh, that my husband took when, um, I was going through and I had bald head and, you know, no eyebrows. And I was laying on the bed and I had my eyes closed and I had one single tear coming down my nose and my daughter was just hugging me and we both had our eyes closed. And it was just that moment of like, <laughs> um, yeah. connection. And they know, they knew, you know, like yeah. this is a hard time. And so we have to like, I'm going to just give mommy a hug because that's what she needs right now, you know? Um, but I think that, um, you really, I mean, communication is a big thing, but also you can't shame yourself. You can't guilt yourself into saying like, I have to, I have to heal. You're not going to heal properly if you can't give yourself that time, you know? Um, and that was a lot of 
a lot of what I told myself is I have to heal so that I can be present with my family. Yeah, right. I love mm-hmm. that you're sharing that because that's one of the things I've seen. And it's interesting, even in like Gabor Mate's work about trauma, and he talks about breast cancer metaphorically being um, not that everyone who has breast cancer has this, but there's a type of woman who gets breast cancer often that is over nurturing. She's taking care of everybody around her. Um, and maybe not showing that kindness, compassion, and grace to herself as as much. And I'll just speak personally because I grew up in a pretty fundamental conservative Christian background where there was a lot of like sh- uh, love others, serve others, and especially the woman was more of a servant heart and a caretaker and nothing wrong with any of those values. But what we weren't necessarily taught about was how to really love and take care of ourselves as well as others. And I think there's a little piece of at least my experience with breast cancer that was turning that towards how do I really show love and compassion? And number one, you mentioned like receiving help. Like it's actually a power role to take care of people, right? When you Mm -hmm. allow someone to take care of you, that's a vulnerability position. And it's actually much more difficult, I think, to let someone to take care of me because I'm being vulnerable and asking for help. And all of those lessons were some of the lessons that I learned in breast cancer that were not common. I wanted to, I'd much rather take care of you or give you a gift than to receive. Um, and the receiving is actually this very vulnerable place. But when we learn that, that's like that full circle. And I think part of both of our healing journeys are all of the chemo, the radiation, the nutrition, but on the other side, in the, in the soul level, it's how do we actually let someone in? How do we admit that we're tired? How do we ask for help? All of these lessons and then still nurturing others, but allowing them to nurture us. Would you say that's true to your journey as well? Absolutely. And learning that throughout was big, you know, because you don't stop. And I think part of that, I thought about that during the cancer too, is like, was this telling me like, you need to stop, you need to just slow down a little bit and um, really figure out like, I, I think I, in your book, you say for every yes, I say five no's. And I think that's so profound because um, so often we just want to say, yes, yes, we'll do this. We'll do this. We'll do this. But you do have to slow down because if you don't, then you're not ever going to, you're not ever going to make it through all the things uh, that you can make it, you know, to make it through. And um, I just, yeah, I, I definitely would agree with that for sure. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I thought I learned all these lessons 20 years ago with the cancer. And just this year, last year was book and movie and lots of travel and it was fun. But by the end of the year, I was so exhausted. I thought I can't do this in 2024. I can't do this again. So I really made a deliberate effort to slow down and and not say yes to so many things once again. But it was funny in February, I was roller skating and I fell and broke my wrist. <laughs> and and all of a sudden, it was such a divine, I literally looked down the moment I, I, I fell, I looked down, first of all, I knew it was broken. It was very obviously misformed. And the second thing I was like, okay, God, I hear you. You want me to slow down? And I'm not slowing down quick enough for, you know, like it was just kind right. of laughed in the moment because I knew so clearly Uh, And maybe people think I'm making too much of it, but the truth is I've heard this like download of you need to slow down and I'm going to give you, it's like, I'm going to make you lie down in green pastures kind of thing. Yes. Perfect. And it was hard, but also perfect. And, um, and it was one of those lessons. And it's funny because here I am 20 years out of breast cancer and God is still teaching me to slow down and to say no. Crazy. Yes. I feel like that, you know, I, and I kind of feel like that a little bit now too, because now that things are kind of, um, uh, post and I'm feeling good and I'm thriving. And then it's like, you just want to do everything like, oh yes, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And, um, and then you get a weekend and, you know, half the weekend is gone for something, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just need at least two days to just recover, you know, just rest. So it is true. And there, yeah, I think God does tell you, Hey, calm down. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Slow down again. Um, anyway, I I laugh because it was such a a very, uh, lesson that was very real and very true. And I still have to learn it. Um, (laughs) so if people out there, well, one thing I want to talk about real quickly that you mentioned that I think is so important. Um, there's a scene in the movie and it's me in the med school and I did not anticipate it. It wasn't scripted, but I, I break down and it was actually hard to show that part, but call the ugly cry. And I talk Mm -hmm. about how I remember back when I was going through medical school and cancer treatment. And you, you mentioned this a little bit, we just have to show up, right? So we try to show up and we kind of try to hide somehow how, how difficult it really is. And now 20 years, looking back at that girl, I had this deep sadness and compassion because I'm like, wow, she had to hold up the world and try to make things okay and still take care of everything. 
And I think part of illness sometimes gives us permission to be real and to ask for help and all these things. Um, if you look back at yourself before cancer and after cancer, what would you say to your before cancer self? Any any words of wisdom now on this side of it that you would give her? Yeah, I I definitely would tell myself to calm down a little bit, you know, slow down. Um, you know, I think I think being vulnerable, especially women too, you know, a lot of things we we like to hide or stuff down um, our emotions or um, I am really like non-confrontational. So I don't really like to bring up anything that's going to cause confrontation, you know, but I, I think now, and I don't know, I also think this could be like for women who don't go through breast cancer, maybe this is like a, an awakening, like in menopause too, you yes. know, where you kind of look and you're like, okay, is it really worth me getting upset over that person that just cut me off on the freeway? No, it's not, you know, maybe they're having a bad day. I'm just going to take a couple deep breaths and just move on with my day, you know, or that we're stuck in this traffic jam. And before I could get so anxious, like, oh my goodness, I'm sitting in this traffic jam and I'm not going to make it there in time, but really there's nothing you can do about it, except, you know what, I'm going to take some big, deep breaths and I'm just going to get there when I get there because I cannot control this. Um, and so I think it, I think one of the big things too, is letting, letting control go, you know, um, I think that's one thing that I really tell myself. I remember before um, breast cancer or when I first found out I had breast cancer, I had written, my mother-in-law was coming to help with the kids and with Ray. And um, it was so lovely for her to come. And I wrote down this journal, like, okay, the kid has, the kids have to go here and this is school and this is that. And, the, and that was my way of controlling what I was about to face. So I was controlling everything. And then COVID happened and I took that journal and threw it in the garbage because it didn't matter because now nothing is the same. So I think that was another, you know, God saying, stop trying to control everything. You're just going to need to let this go, you know? Um, so I definitely, I think maybe tell my younger self, like, calm down, chill out, stop controlling everything. You need to take some breaths. And sometimes you just need to let it be, you know? Oh, that is such good advice. I could not agree more. And I think it's, um, it is actually a kind of a stressor and not great for our nervous system to kind of hang on so tightly to those details and things. And yet it's so natural because it feels like we have control. And I think one of the things that cancer or any chronic uh, severe illness that brings us is the reality that we really don't have all the control that we think we do. But mm -hmm. by, by actually, it's almost like if we have this old crunky stuffed teddy bear that's in our hands and we're like grabbing onto it. And there's this big, beautiful new thing that, that someone has for us. And we're like, no, I want my old teddy bear. And we have this like grip so tightly on something that we think we want when this beautiful, amazing thing is waiting for us. And, um, you can just see, cause you can see kids act like that. Right. And it's so natural, but yeah. as we learn to surrender to life and let go and really like, no, and I'm sure you feel this way and I continue to learn, but it almost feels like because we've been through cancer, there's difficulties will come and we're not done with them. Right. But don't right. you feel a little bit more brave and a little bit more uh, uh, ready for whatever life brings you? Not that it won't be difficult, mm -hmm. but when we've been through that, it's almost like, okay, bring it on. I know yes. now, right? Like you have the resources to handle whatever comes. Yes. And I used to tell myself, it was funny. Um, I met a really good friend of mine in chemo and um, we call each other breasties now. Awesome. Uh, it's super cute. So I met her, uh, we were both like the same age. And because we went through chemo during 2020, we weren't allowed to have a support person in there. And so her and I became each other support people. And so when we had our ports out, we couldn't have somebody in there. So we were in there for each other. Um, and so we just kind of went through the whole process together, which was really great. But um, we... Uh, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. We were just talking about the, um, the, um, when, whatever life brings you, you know, you're going to be okay. Cause, uh, and be, having your breasty breasty there beside you. <laughs> yes. Yes. And being able to, um, just being able to have her there and, um, and knowing that somebody else is like going through this with me and, you know, here's my support person. It was just, it was really great. Just, being able to have her experiences with us, with me and us being able to do that and feeling strong and empowered. We were strong and empowering each other throughout everything. You know, we were able to, um, 
do, I think at one, one point in time, we said, you know what, we are going to go and have our whole chest painted. So we had, we went to this lady who just did body paint. And so she painted this whole mural on both of our chests. And we went out to like the art district in, um, down off of Broadway and the art district. And we just posed, my sister-in-law took pictures of us just fully exposed with this beautiful painting on our chest. And we just felt fierce. And it was just so great to have that little bit of you know that support and that camaraderie with each other and just feeling like you know it was great and I remember her, she said oh it was the funniest thing so this kid rode by on a bike and she's out there you know exposed with her you know mural and he's like you are so beautiful and she said well thank you and you're welcome <laughs> oh I love that so much what an incredible empowering story and I think what you're also saying is just like this um in the difficulties, we know how to get the resource. Like you had this place where COVID's like, no one can come in with you, right? But you mm -hmm. found a way to create um, connection and to create support, even in the midst of a place where you, you know, weren't allowed to have your family members or whatever else there. I love that. I love that mm -hmm. so much. Oh, Jamie, this is just, it's so fun to talk to you on this level and to share, especially now that we're on the other side of everything, not only your yes. cancer and your overcoming, but even the filming um, what would you say, did the filming bring another layer to that? Or even now sharing your story with the world, is there anything specific that you're grateful for that um, this process allowed you to show or share or do in the filming process? Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely, I am so grateful that I was able to meet you and Aaron and Daniel for sure. Um, you guys have just been such a blessing in my life. And I remember just feeling so comfortable sharing, um, which was, which was a huge thing, you know, when you're so vulnerable and you're so there, it, you're on a deep level of, of emotion going through something like this, you know, and you were saying, you know, we're in the space of like, this is our, our space, our sacred space, but I felt so comfortable. And there were plenty of times I, I just cried filming um at, I remember once at the house and just I don't know I feel like there was times where I was able really to just let go of some of the, my deepest um fears and you know again back to that why me and I kept say I kept asking myself questions on like what did I do um am I am I being punished is this something I'm being punished for and there were certain there were different stories that went along with that which I expressed um and I remember it was one of those like, okay, you got to cut this on the chopping block. Like this cannot go in the film. Um, but, um, but just the, and I remember sitting there with Aaron once and just crying together a couple of times. That was one particular time. And he was like, you know, and just gave me that reassurance of like, no, this is, this is not a punishment. This is not what this is about. Um, and just for past deeds or whatever, you know, and there was another moment um, where I remember sitting up in, in my room and Aaron was filming and, or Aaron was there kind of talking through some things and behind me. So he said, do you see what's happening here? And I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, he's like in front of you, I had sprawled out all over my floor, all of these, um, cards and banners and poster boards that people, when I had come out of chemo, they had, um, my husband and my sister-in-law, they had all planned to be out there. They all had masks on and because nobody could come in. And so everybody was outside. I had no idea. Everyone was outside with like balloons and flowers and, and poster boards and everything. I mean, people from my church and my family and everyone, my kids and their friends, everybody standing out there with masks on. And I had come out and I I just saw everyone and they were just on my last chemo and they were just shouting and telling me like, congratulations. And the nurses came out and I just, I mean, it was like the ugly cry. Like you were saying, it was like the legit ugly, and I was bald and no eyelash, you know, and just ugly cry. Um, and so I was sitting with Aaron and had all of these things sprawled out in front of me. And, um, he goes, you see what's happening here? And I was like, no, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't, I'm, what are you talking about? And he's like, He's like, you have all of this love in front of you and behind you on that little TV tray you have behind you is all of those pharmaceuticals. And he's like, you've got your back turned to those. And in front of you is all this love and support. And I was like, oh, you know, and it was just this like really big emotional moment, just sit in the bedroom talking to, you know, and sharing all of that. So I'm just so grateful for moments like that, that I will I, I cherish, you know, I still hold them deep and, and I felt, you know, I felt seen, I felt 
heard. I felt comfortable. Um, and I, I never once felt, um, overwhelmed in sharing anything. I just really felt like there was that level of comfort that all of you guys, that authenticity that I could be myself and, you know, my family is just here and we could all be ourselves and, and it was okay. And, um, and I just hope that, um, I guess I just hope that my, my part of the story, um, can resonate with other people like that too, you know, Jamie, there's no doubt that it will. And I'm just, like I said, in the beginning, it is such an honor that you would share your personal journey with the world through this film. And, and like I said, for me, it's just, I am, thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing us to share our own relationship as doctor patient and, and now friends and, um, just it's amazing to me. And I know that people will be inspired and impacted. The scene we just watched is one of my favorite scenes too. Every time I get to <laughs> Um, so the exciting thing is you're now, oh, it's funny because we talked about that scene where I'm hugging you and like, this isn't the end. There's going to be something greater. Well, I can't wait to get to this part of the show because <laughs> you are out there now you're coaching, you're doing a program. Tell us what you are doing in the world, um, to make a difference because you're out there doing it now. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. I, um, I am doing a few things. So I'm, I just decided to start on my own business with my husband. He's, you know, a video marketer. And so him and I have been really planning up a storm. Um, but it's called the breast method with, uh, an E at the end. So we're turning that into a ribbon, okay. but, um, we, I'm on Instagram and everything, but we are, we are trying to work together to build a, um, developing a workout and nutrition program for osteoporosis prevention, uh, osteopenia reversal, because, um, through my journey, I, I was also diagnosed with osteopenia and I have begin, I've been beginning to reverse it, which has been amazing. So, um, I just got results back in December and I've, uh, yeah, my lumbar spine is looking better. My hips are looking better. So it's been really great. Um, so I'm working on a, a program that I'm developing and for people like that, you know, osteoporosis prevention, uh, reversals. So that way I can, um, help others in that way. So I'm working on that to release it. Um, I'm actually working on my corrective exercise uh, program and my cancer exercise specialist program as well for exercising and for coming up with fitness plans and workouts. Uh, I, I personal train at a place called Total Fitness Colorado in Highlands Ranch. I'm teaching classes at Choose Fitness. And I also am just got certified um, with um, electromuscular stimulation at a, a new place called Ohm, which is so amazing. They use red light cell therapy and use electro um, muscular stimulation suits that you wear. So it's low impact, uh, it lowers your cortisol, your cortisol isn't spiking, you know, uh, and they're 25 minute workouts. So they're, it's amazing. So this place is in Lone Tree and I in Denver. Try that. <laughs> yes. You need to come to my class. <laughs> Yes. It's so cool. And yeah, you put on a suit and it's just 25 minutes, so low impact and, um, and you're getting, you know, 65 to 85, um, uh, pulses per contractions per second in your muscles, as opposed to like one or two in your lifting, plus you're not wrecking havoc on your joints. So, um, that's a really great option. I know a lot of people have used that in, um, therapy and your Jeremy Renner and stuff. I'd use it in therapy to walk again. So, um, it's really cool that it's so innovative um, that we're using it now to help build strength. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm just working, I'm, I'm doing this right now, but ultimately really what I want to do is work with other people who, you know, have gone through cancer, have gone through surgeries, chemo radiation and osteoporosis, osteo you know, Pena and working with those people and not just in getting them um, feeling fit and healthy again, but also, um, emotionally, because it is such an emotional journey too. So being able to relate on that emotional level, along with, all right, let's, let's get in this suit and do, you know, 20 push ups on your knees, though, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it'll be great. So I'm, that's really where I want to go with my life. Hiding Jamie Lynn Bailey, and where can people find you? Is there a website? Give us your Instagram. 
So right now I'm the breast method with an E on Instagram. Right now we also have a YouTube channel that we are starting. It's very early in this process, but we are starting it. So YouTube is also the breast method as well. Um, and then, oh, one more really exciting thing. I just got um, I just got asked or nominated to the Miss Health and Fitness cover of the hers magazine so i haven't um so i have we have to they open voting here soon but i was one of the people selected to be in the running for it so i think it opens up in like 16 days to vote so i'm going to be pl placing all that of course on my instagram so hopefully maybe i could be on the cover and and uh my story can be shared so a little bit more to be able to share the story with others connect. I love it so much. And like I said, this is just the beginning for you because you're going to keep changing the world in your corner and um, love the new work. Jamie, thank you for sharing your heart with us today. Thank you for sharing in the movie, your journey. I know it will impact so many people, but most of all, I'm just grateful for you. Oh, and I couldn't be more blessed to have you in my life. And I'm just so thankful for you. And I'm thankful for you making me healthy again. I mean, I, yes, I took all the things that you told me to do, but you were the one who said, we can do this, you know, and the inspiration and the support and the love that I felt from you since day one has just been second to none. And so I'm just, I'm so blessed to have you in my life and I'm so grateful for you. So thank you so much. And thank you again for inviting me to be part of this podcast and part of this film. And I'm so excited. I can't wait for it to get out there. And um, I'm super excited. I'm going to be sharing it all over the place. So <laughs> but I just love you. <laughs> I love you too, Jamie. And it is an absolute honor. So if you haven't watched it, drpatientmovie.com. Until next time, thank you guys.